Good morning, everybody. My name is Jens Chapman, and today is August 5th, 2020. And uh, thank you all for your interest in our STED Talk Spine Technology Education Discovery Debate, and um, more or less trying to push the frontiers. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have our guest speaker with us today from Virginia Mason, Dr. Venu Nemani. Um, he is a neurological surgery colleague and uh, he's right downtown and he's going to talk about the effect of spine fusion and spine alignment on the hip joint. As always, um, we start with some of our fellows and this gives me the opportunity to just reflect briefly upon um, uh, uh, the bigger picture. So first of all, our heart goes out uh, to the uh, citizens of Beirut and Lebanon for this catastrophe. Please note that one of our fellows, and you'll see him shortly, Dr. Elias Elias, is from Lebanon. And uh, again, our hearts and thoughts are uh, with uh, his people back home. On a much uh, smaller, lighter front, I'll ask Lee to flash up the picture. Uh, last night we had our first Spine Trivia Night. As you know, we have just about every day of the week uh, filled with some educational content. And uh, Tuesday nights is interesting case discussions. To kick off the year, we had Spine Trivia Night. And although we hosted it, it was organized by the Texas Back Institute. And three competitors were there. Uh, the Texas Back Institute, Rush from Chicago, and the Neuroscience Institute. And the winner was, drum roll, Swedish Neuroscience Institute, apparently, I was in the OR, uh, a come from behind victory at the very, very last second. So I'm just gonna stop for a second. Lee, is everything okay? Yeah. Yeah, and is our guest speaker online? Is Dr. Nemani online? Yes, uh, Jens, I'm here. Good morning, how are you? Good morning. Hey, Silvino, uh, we would like to have your input on three quick cases, and then uh, pretty much at, uh, if okay with you, at 7.30, we'll switch to your presentation. Is that okay? Sure, that sounds great. Okay, so why don't you introduce yourself? Um, our first speaker is one of our new fellows, and where you're from, and uh, uh, then briefly, let's review the case and ask for Dr. Nemani's input. All right, good morning everyone. My name is Puria Gayomi. I'm one of the new fellows at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. Uh, I just finished my orthopedics residency at USC and I'm excited to be here. So the case that I'm presenting is a case that was actually presented last week by one of the outgoing fellows, but we thought it would be relevant to this talk as well. One sec. Okay, I'll be good to go. Sorry, having some issues here. So our patient is a 28-year-old male with uh, had a spontaneous T5-6 cord infarction at the age of 15 uh, that left him uh, wheelchair-bound. He has T8 sensory level. He, uh, back in 2017, started noted increasing weakness and burning in his legs for about three months, as well as increased back pain. Uh, on his imaging at that time, he had uh, evidence of destruction of L1, L2, uh, uh, vertebrae, at, initially he had an extensive workup for an infectious process, but uh, the eventual diagnosis ended up being a Charcot arthropathy. Um, subsequently, he underwent L1-2 uh, decompression posterior spinal fusion. He actually did quite well initially in terms of pain relief. Um, however, he had progression of his disease subsequently and went on to uh, failure of the hardware. Uh, this is in um, July of 2017. So subsequent to that, he underwent T4 to pelvis uh, posterior spinal fusion um, in August, followed by L1, L2, uh, L1, L2, L2, L3, uh, XLIF. Uh, once again, he did quite well initially. He, uh, the instability that he was experiencing at the time completely resolved. His pain improved. Uh, however, on follow-up in, um, in September of that, uh, in 2018, he started, uh, the, the instability, instability started increasing. He started having lucency around the screws and was concerned for non-union pseudoarthrosis at that time. Um, so in November of 2018, uh, he underwent revision of his posterior spinal fusion and, um, and posterior and, and inner body cage placement at, L1, uh, at L4-5 and L5-S1. Uh, he, at this point, he is, his last follow-up was actually in January with us. 
He is doing quite well. The instability has pretty much resolved and he has started more intense rehab program at this point. Thank you. So uh, go back to the uh, last slide. Um, so this case, um, Veno is being shown for several reasons. Uh, one is um, to demonstrate how hard it can be in patients who don't have perfect neurologic control of their lower trunk calf to gain a fusion and a reasonable alignment uh, due to the long lever arms involved. Secondly, and that's pertaining to your topic today, um, there's an incredible stress transfer from the trunk through the pelvis into the hip joints, through the SI joints. So um, this stress transfer is obviously going to be the subject of your talk. So in the first uh, point, Vino, I'd like to ask for your opinion. Uh, these, these kind of patients who don't have good trunk control, where we are forced to do long fusions, pose huge problems. Do you have any comment on the nature of the case and where we failed? Should we have just done this all-out kind of a multi-level, uh, massive instrumentation right off the bat? Or where did we go wrong, let's put it this way? Why did we not get it right the first time? Maybe I'll switch to Rod first yeah. and ask uh, Lee to check our connections again. So these are challenging cases because of all the reasons that Dr. Chapman mentioned is that um, you know, you're dealing with basically an entire torso and you're trying to get this uh, spine to fuse. And it's literally a race between the hardware failing and the bone fusing. And part of the issue with um, is getting a fusion over so many levels and the stresses are so huge here because of the fact that you're dealing with the pelvis, the lower extremities, um, and is, go back one more slide. You can see just even, uh, and then go back one more, do go back to the initial surgery. You can see how quickly this fell apart. Um, there he had the MIS procedure done. So keep that on. Sure. So, um, you know, it's just one of those things, and literally, like, we staged him um, and then brought him back, and so, just because of the fact that just even be in between the staging, you could see that there was some lucency in the screws uh, that are in between where the uh, Charcot arthropathy is. And most of these patients, like this patient, was misdiagnosed. They, they thought he had a spinal infection after the MIS fusion. So he was on, so for you know, several months, he was on antibiotics. He got seen by ID, um, and so it's just the amount of forces that you're dealing with is astronomical, and the failure failure rate is fairly high. And so we usually try to get both inner body support and um, and the distal fixation on, uh, including the pelvis and the sacrum. I think the big mistake I made on this case is that I didn't put S1 screws and I didn't do an inner body at 5.1 and 4.5. But literally, the only reason I didn't is because we were staging it. Um, and, uh, and so when we brought him back, we we're gonna do an X lift and then do an A lift. Um, and, uh, and he failed in between. It was like three months. So let's try again. Uh, Vino, we've communicated. Uh, Lee, can you split the screen and put Vino on? Um, okay. Vino, can you hear us at least? Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can hear you and see you, and it's oh. a great looking bike. Uh, do you want to, are you sponsored by this company or? Yeah, I, I, I wish. If I was, I'd probably be out on a ride right now. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, so I, I would completely echo everything that, that Roz said. Um, I think these are really, really challenging cases. I think in any patient with a long standing neurological defect, uh, kind of like the one that, um, uh, that that this patient has, I think that one of the first things that you have to think about in the absence of uh, of infection of a reason to think infection is is Charcot. And uh, to to invoke the words of one of my former mentors in cases like this, 
go long and strong and never say you're sorry. Uh, and so the I, I think that in cases of Charcot, where you're worried about um, uh, about a patient's neurologic control and and um, already start to see some bony destruction. Um, I think I, uh, I'm not sure that you'd have to go as long as the final construct or as as uh, as mega with with five iliac bolts. But but certainly I think um, more fixation is is generally better. And I think that you had the right uh, idea certainly with you know backing it up with inner body grafts and and some anterior column support. But I think that this is the common problem with these uh, patients. Like you said, there's a big lever arm. Uh, they often will have hip joint contraction fractures if they're wheelchair bound, uh, further increasing the, the, the lever arm on the spine and, and setting you up for a lot of mechanical stress that can result in pseudoarthrosis and failure. Great, uh, super, thank you uh, for that input. Now, pertinent to your talk, um, uh, if we can split the screen again, please, Lee. Um, Rod put a lot of lordosis into this patient. Now, this is a partial ambulator only. Can you briefly address the question of uh, uh, alignment and lordosis, hyperlordosis on the hip joints? I know you, I don't want to have you preempt your talk later, but uh, there's a lot of lordosis in this, which is usually preferable, but in a partial ambulator, what does that mean, and what does it mean for the hips in general? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a great question. Um, you know, basically, I think what you're what you're alluding to is that the position of the spine changes in a standing versus a seated position. And typically, in an ambulator, we're trying to optimize uh, a patient's um, uh, standing alignment. Um, you know, in which we we know in general that uh, your lumbar lordosis should estimate your your pelvic instance. But um, as as I kind of uh, talk about in my in my presentation that. In, a, in the sitting position, the lumbar lordosis and all of these pelvic parameters change, and not the incidence, of course, but um, but you have a change in the pelvic tilt and you have a decrease in the lumbar lordosis. And so certainly, uh, I'm not sure anyone's really looked at this effectively, but um, uh, I think it would not be an unreasonable thing to, to put l less lumbar, lord lumbar lordosis into a spine where someone's a sitter. Um, by increasing the, uh, having that amount of lumbar lordosis and having the, the sacrum and pelvis fixed uh, in this construct, certainly you're asking the hips to do a lot more uh, movement, uh, basically, um, you know, in terms of uh, needing to flex relative to the position of the pelvis uh, because your pelvis is essentially fixed in in an anterior pelvic tilt, basically, you know, or decreased pelvic tilt. So um, I think it's an interesting question, um, not one that's really been parsed out. And uh, just to conclude this case, um, uh, Puria, can you tell us how the patient did? Yeah, so his last follow-up was in January, and uh, he's actually doing quite well. Uh, he's doing quite well. His instability in his spine is resolved, and his pain has improved dramatically, and he's starting to do rehab more aggressively at this point. Yeah. Is there a plan to get a routine CAT scan on a patient uh, like him to see bone healing, let's say, a half year, a year out? Yeah, I believe given that he had this issues previously, if he starts, obviously, if he starts to become symptomatic, that would be, uh, that would be the plan to get scanned to make sure that he's not developing pseudoarthrosis again. Uh, but given that he has failed twice at this point, I think that's probably a good idea to follow up in a few months to make sure that he's healing properly. Thank you, Puria. Our next fellow is ready. Venu, are you ready? I'll ask our next fellow to introduce himself. So hi, my name is Elias Elias. I'm a new fellow here at the Swedish Institute. I come from Lebanon. Uh, I just want to say that yesterday was a very sad day for Lebanon and for the people of Beirut. And uh, I hope everyone is fine. Uh, and uh, I hope for the best days for Lebanon. So today I will present uh, a case that was done here last week. So this is an 80-year-old female. She's, uh, she has uh, multiple comorbidities. She has uh, chronic back pain, osteoporosis, scoliosis. She has hip pain, she's cachectic, and she's on chronic uh, opioids medications. She a question mark about her dementia. Uh, she presented to the ED department after falling down on her back, uh, and she presented on top of her chronic pain with acute back pain. Uh, the chronic pain radiated uh, to her uh, low back, posterior thigh, and back to her knees. Uh, upon presentation, her physical exam was, uh, was normal. She had a good motor power, but uh, she had some urinary retention. 
her previous surgical history was uh, a previous L4 to L5 decompression and fusion. So they did a CT scan for her in the ER. It shows here you can see the L4, L5 instrumentation. Excuse me. Uh, she, she has a T10 loss of height about 70%. This was followed by an MRI lumbar. And as you can see here, I could not pull up like the whole, uh, the whole pictures, but uh, this is the L3, L4 level. This is a T2 axial cut. And uh, we don't have any more, like we cannot see the CSF fluid. So we have a severe central stenosis with uh, bilateral foraminal stenosis and you have multi-level degenerative disease. And regarding the thoracic MRI, this is also, a, as you can see, this is a sagittal cut. This is a sagittal cut, and you can see the titan level with a mild retropulsion. And on the right, you can see the axial cut, and the right upper quadrant, you can see this is a flare image of the titan fracture. Great. Uh, thank you for the summary, Elias. And again, thank you for presenting under these hard circumstances. It's a true pleasure and honor to have you here. And as I said in the beginning, uh, our thoughts are with you. We'll look at uh, some active help also. So, Vinu, uh, if we can go on the split screen again, uh, Lee. Uh, Vinu, so this is a patient, elderly, maybe a little bit demented. She's pleasantly demented. Um, the, the clinical problem here is uh, she can't walk anymore, and people had said this is her hip joint. Uh, she has this kind of a groin pain. If she hurts with the hip. We don't have the hip film to show you, but your neurosurgical colleague assumed that it's not a great looking hip. And she has this terrible stenosis at L34 shown on the MRI. She has a T10 burst fracture. It's older, it's a bad skeleton. She has deformity. So, where do you start with this? Again, she has no objective neurologic deficits. She hurts with a hip motion. Um, she, she has a clear focal problem. It could be an L3 radiculopathy. You don't really want to inject that because there's no CSF passage whatsoever. How do you unravel that clinically? Yeah, I think this is a really, really challenging and unfortunately common problem that we, that we deal with with patients that come into the emergency room. And, and especially in the setting of, of, uh, of chronic pain, it becomes a little bit more difficult because uh, you know, obviously everything is going to hurt in this patient. Um, I think that if you can get your, in these patients that have critical stenosis, um, uh, like she does at L34, um, I've often found that my anesthesia colleagues would be willing to try a transforaminal injection or maybe even a selective nerve root block where they come uh, outside in and, and, and get the nerve root, um, you know, from uh, um, uh, outside the spinal canal. And sometimes that can give you some benefit. Uh, it's un undoubtedly the, the L34 level is symptomatic and, and, and the T10 level as well. I couldn't tell on the MRI pictures uh, how, involved, how much bony retropulsion there was at uh, the, that, that level of the burst fracture. Um, you know, I think that certainly if this were a patient that was outside the hospital, I would probably think twice about offering surgery right away before trying to, you know, optimize her opioids and, and, you know, improve some of the cachexia and get her nutrition up and, and get her bone quality up. Um, because I think that, you know, the question here is, do you do something big and try to fix everything? Or do you try to do something small and just manage the adjacent level degeneration and do something, either brace the, the, the burst fracture or uh, even a vertebroplasty, um, as long as you can be careful not to get any cement into the canal. Um, I think I would be tempted to try something smaller in this lady rather than uh, really bridging up Cross that uh, burst fracture, which basically means going down to the pelvis as well. So, so you have great predictive uh, capabilities. So why don't you go forward, Elias, and resolve yeah, the so, case? Yeah, so uh, what was done here is that to fix the adjacent level disease, so the four or five screws were removed and were replaced with the newer, newer hardware. And uh, Dr. Rod and Dr. Chapman, they went a level up, a higher uh, one level up. They did the L3, L4, uh, also decompression and fusion. And uh, regarding the T10 fracture, uh, I think the interventionist, uh, interventional radiologist he did uh, vertebroplasty. Great. So we did what you said. Uh, um, we felt that the rest of the scoliosis was very stable. We did. Uh, this is a somewhat precarious patient, so we did not want to wage an all-out uh, war there. Uh, 
We did a very focal decompression. She had surprisingly good bone in that area. And uh, the, the amazing thing is that she's actually mobilizing quite well. So those uh, grotty looking hips actually um, they have served a well before, and uh, we didn't use the transferaminal idea that's, I don't know how it is for you, and as an inpatient, it's very hard for us to get those. We would have had to send her out, and she's simply not mobile. A lot of begging and pleading, and sometimes it doesn't happen. <laughs> Same thing, yeah. It's a reimbursement issue. So, so far, so good. Stay tuned. Our assessment also was that she was pretty stable in her scoliosis above L3, but L3-4 had just become very unstable. So we felt that this was a transferred uh, hip pain. Maybe we'll ask our last uh, fellow to come up. Thank you, Elias. Thank you. I'm looking forward to, uh, to a great year with you here. Thank you. And we'll ask our last fellow, who some of you may recognize. He is spending an extra month as a transition fellow. Grateful to have him here. I'll ask him to introduce himself again. He has a case that has not been completed yet, so uh, input would be very much appreciated. Uh, morning, everyone. My name is Lincoln Jimenez, one of the fellows here uh, at Swedish. Um, uh, today, I'm going to present a case for decision making. Uh, this is an interesting case of a 76-year-old female who um, has uh, chronic hist uh, history of chronic back pain. Unfortunately, the patient uh, also has some other uh, medical issues. Um, but um, other than that, the patient actually has been progressively getting weak. And because of the pain and also some of the compression that she's had, and we'll actually show that in our films, uh, she has been bed bound four days before actually coming to the hospital. Uh, other than that, the patient has, in the past, uh, seen a spine surgery right before she came to our service, and who unfortunately both uh, the decision making at that time was just to recommend conservative management just because of uh, age uh, and other, um, other medical issues that she was uh, having, such as the condition. And past medical history, she has diabetes mellitus, and um, also she's a chronic smoker. She's been uh, using uh, chronic opioids and uh, in general, of course, just because she's been bent bound, she's been deconditioned. Uh, when we evaluated her, we also found on a lapse an increase, a progressively increasing ESR, which was suspected for uh, an infectious process, along with a white count of 18. Uh, the um, uh, examination actually showed uh, particularly distal uh, weakness, uh, knee flexion and uh, ankle uh, flexion extension uh, were very uh, compromised. And uh, other than that, there were some uh, compromised reflexes, but uh, there were not much of a, a big issue there. Um, uh, she, is, as I said before, she has history of scoliosis, and uh, as we see here, she has a uh, uh, pretty bad scoliosis, particularly at the L2, uh, uh, L2, 3 level. And although I don't see it right here, uh, she also has some uh, degenerative uh, changes, which uh, hopefully we'll see on the next slide. Uh, well, we have the MRI. Unfortunately, I, I did not put the, the CAT scan here. But uh, what we see here is an L2, 3 high uh, grade stenosis with a, a cystic or fluid cyst like structure. And uh, some possible infection just based on this. Excuse me. <clears throat> um, and uh, of course, uh, just based on this, and uh, as I said before, uh, the cats can actually did show yeah. some uh, air in, in the in, in their uh, discal space. Uh, some instability just based on, on on this finding. There was also some lateral dysthesis and uh, advanced facet arthropathy. Um, these, of course, we did not have a prior uh, imaging to compare these like a year or two years before. Um, but, um, uh, oh, look, uh, so yes, I had it. I'm sorry about that. Let's see if I can. So, whoop, what happened? So, so, this is what I was trying to talk about. So, uh, degenerative disc disease with uh, some uh, air in the intradiscal space, which is suspected not only for. Um, instability, but also for uh, source of infection there. So at this time, and of course, uh, as, as I mentioned before, the patient had been seen by a different spine service who recommended conservative management. 
Uh, and at this time we decided, we, we said, okay, well, let's, let's see what her medical condition is before we actually make a decision on whether to operate or not. But we were seeing a patient who, were, who was actually deteriorating in our face with progressive weakness. So the question is, are we gonna do conservative management or um, surgical management? So. So Vino, um, if you can switch to the split screen again. Uh, there's no primary hip pathology here, but uh, VM has kind of become legendary around uh, the country and the world for its multidisciplinary decision-making conference. We had significant discussions with our internists and anesthesiologists about this patient. She also has sacral decubital ulcers, and this is a sad story of an opiate uh, treatment failure, a non-constructive, uh, non-surgical management. So what are your thoughts? Do you still do these multidisciplinary conferences for decision-making for surgeries? And what if there are significant differences of opinions between surgeons and internists? Who wins? Yeah, it's a great question. I, I would say that, you know, for this, the, the multidisciplinary conferences that we do are primarily for elective spine patients. I think when you have an, uh, an inpatient who's admitted with a neurologic deficit, all of that essentially goes out the window. And I think that, you know, if this is a true neurologic deficit, um, that, that that needs to be addressed, you know. And someone who's got general deconditioning and things, uh, I think it, sometimes, as you guys, as you all know, sometimes it'd be difficult to parse out a true neurologic deficit versus versus generalized weakness and poor effort on exam. Um, but if this is a, thought to be a true neurologic deficit from what looks like clear instability, at that L23 level and, and severe stenosis at that level, I think that we would we would find a way to treat this patient surgically and, and, and decompress her. Um, now, it, um, I think that the value in conferences is only as good as the colleagues that, that, that you have. And so I think the more time we spend with our internists and the anesthesiologists, I think the more we start to each develop an understanding of what the other people of the other person is thinking. And so we tend to often converge on the same uh, same answers, but uh, if there's a difference in opinion, usually sometimes we'll kick the can down the road to another meeting uh, and uh, and then figure out if, uh, if we can't have a consensus, if it's a patient that can't wait in an elective situation. But I think in this patient with a neurologic deficit, as long as it's thought to be a true neurologic deficit, uh, we would proceed with uh, some sort of surgical treatment um, if, if necessary. And one more question. Would you go high or uh, and big or very focal? Again, this patient has significant deformity. She has osteoporosis. She's a smoker. I know yeah. you, have, you have very few images here, so it's not quite fair, but just in general. Sure. As a um, yeah, so she's, she's clearly, I mean, I think the scoliosis is centered at that L23 where she's got all that vacuum in the disc space. She's got an autofusion, uh, it looks like, at the L5S1 level. Um, and so, and then I, you know, and as you said, I didn't see all the images, but it looks like the most severe stenosis is at L23. Um, this would be one in, in such a otherwise debilitated medically complex patient, I might do something small and just try to put in a large graft in the inner body space at L23 and, and, and back that up with screws and, and the decompression and, and hope that with good, uh, a large cage and anterior column support, um, and that would at least address the area of stenosis and leave the, the bigger surgery for another day. The good thing is with the, um, that L23 level is it's so mobile that the bone has become very sclerotic at those two segments. So even though she has she may have global osteoporosis, the L2 and L3 levels look like they may actually have focally pretty good bone, actually. And so, so I think that you, your fixation there uh, and ability to hold a large graft actually looks pretty good. Um, and so you may be able to continue with a small surgery. That's really the only level where she has severe stenosis. Great insights. Thank you. So um, I could obviously add in the wrinkle now that she has a really bad hip on one side, but let's just do that as an abstract, uh, a hypothetical, as a segue to your talk. So ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to have you know, Nimani here, MD, PhD. He's a colleague at Virginia Mason. And he is going to educate us on his insights on how to deal with concurrent uh, hip and back problems and uh, issues of alignment, wear and tear, and patient satisfaction. So thank you, Vino, for joining us this morning for our STED Talk.
Thank you very much, Jens. I really appreciate you guys having me. Um, I think you guys have a great uh, speaker series, um, and, and it's really, I think it really benefits uh, people from around the world and, and around the country. And so I think it's a great resource that you guys have, and uh, thanks uh, very much for having me on here. Let me just see if I can share my screen here. All right, can you guys... Uh, All right, can you guys see my screen okay now? Yes. Okay, great. So um, the title of my talk is um, uh, <clears throat> The Effect of Spinal Fusion and Spinal Alignment on the Hip, and um, I, have, I have no disclosures. As the years have gone on, especially in the last five to 10 years, uh, we've all seen pictures like this. Uh, I think with the increasing use of stereoradiography, uh, we've really come to appreciate the interplay of the spine and spinal deformity on the alignment of other joints in the body, and, and namely the, the hip and the pelvis. Um, I don't think any spine surgeon can go through training these days in the last um, probably five to 10 years without having heard of spinopelvic alignment and parameters and how important it is to have an appreciation for uh, spinopelvic alignment and, and how that affects um, uh, the, the onset of deformity and, and how you would address or fix the deformity. These are uh, uh, stereoradiographic uh, images here showing the progression of, of a typical degenerative scoliosis. And the, the thing to note here is that this patient has a, has a total hip replacement in place. So you can actually see, uh, uh, based on these images, the changes in alignment of the hip joint actually with with uh, changes in the spinal alignment. On the left is uh, someone with basically normal spinal alignment. And you can see that the, the hip, knee, and ankle all fall into a line um, and, uh, and, and are in appropriate alignment that fall along the, the gravity axis of the spine. In the center image, you have a, a beginning spinal deformity. And so you can see some increased pelvic tilt in this patient. And you can see that the sacrum has become more vertical and the, uh, the hip joint now is uh, really centered anterior to the, the, the spinal uh, gravity line axis. Um, but you, have, you haven't seen some of the other changes, such as knee flexion and ankle dorsiflexion, or a global spinal deformity where the head is now falling anterior to the pelvis, which is what you see in that third picture, where this patient has uh, really maximized and, and run out of compensatory mechanisms to, to maintain their global alignment. And so they're left with their head fairly far forward of their, um, of their gravity line axis. You have flexion of the hips and flexion of the knees and, and ankle dorsiflexion, all in an attempt to try to, to maintain an upright balance. But you can see with the, the total hip replacement there, the, the changes in the actual um, uh, alignment of the hip and the pelvis. As spine surgeons, we have developed our own measurements to quantify some of these changes in alignment. And so we look and measure things like thoracic kyphosis, lumbar lordosis, uh, the plumb line of C7 or T1 as it, um, as it relates in the sagittal plane to the location of the closer to the corner of the uh, sacral lung plate. And these are all measurements that I think give us a sense of the global alignment of the spine. As we've come to learn more about the, um, the pelvis and its importance, we've developed um, measurements such as pelvic tilt and pelvic incidence and sacral slope. And we all know how those are related with uh, uh, pelvic tilt and sacral slope, with some of those being um, uh, pelvic incidence. And then there are some more measurements, and really you can kind of, um, uh, you, you can find hundreds of measurements these days that you can, uh, uh, that you can make to describe the alignment of the spine and the relationship with the spine with the, with the pelvis. But all in all, you know, the, the, the workhorse measurements that we make are the lumbar lordosis and, and thoracic kyphosis, SVA, and, and pelvic incense, sacral slope, and pelvic tilt. Um, hip surgeons also think about the pelvis and think about the alignment of the, of the hip joint and the pelvis in space. But they have different terminology that they use uh, to describe these parameters. And so this has been part of the confusion as hip surgeons and spine surgeons began to talk um, is that we don't actually use the same language. And so I think for spine surgeons, it's important to know what the hip surgeons are calling 
the same the, the same things that we look at. They just have different names. For them. And so they tend to refer to things um, uh, with regards to the anterior pelvic plane. And the anterior pelvic plane is basically a measurement that goes from the ASIS to the tip of the pubic symphysis. And that is essentially the, the plane of the pelvis. And so then what we refer to as pelvic tilt, the hip surgeons refer to as spinopelvic tilt, which again is the measurement from the center of the sacral end plate to the bicoxofemoral axis. And then that's a, a line that's subtended against a, the uh, a vertical axis. They also use a term called interplane pelvic tilt or APP tilt. And basically that is a, um, a line that measures the anterior pelvic plane line. So that goes from ASIS to the pubic symphysis, and then that's measured against the vertical. But basically these things are measuring essentially the same thing. And they're taking, they're looking at how the pelvis is oriented related to expanding vertical plane. Um, what you can see here in these pictures um, uh, and, and what hip surgeons are primarily interested in is how changes occur uh, when, when uh, patients are standing versus uh, versus sitting. And the reason why this is important is that one of the most um, uh, devastating mechanical complication uh, after hip replacement is dislocation. And this commonly occurs in when patients are doing this change in position, going from standing to sitting or sitting to standing. And you can see uh, on this on these x-rays that you have, the one on the left is standing and the one on the right is sitting, that the pelvis does not look the same. And I'll show some schematic images to describe what those changes are that occur upon sitting, standing to sitting and how that affects the orientation of the, of the hip joint itself. What this means for us as spine surgeons is that we also have to understand the implications of the corrections that we do on um, on the hip joint because many patients will have uh, concurrent hip and spine pathology as uh, as in some of the cases that were presented this morning. And so these are some recent cases uh, uh, that I did that were, these were both three column osteotomy procedures. And if you look carefully at the pelvis and they kind of ignore the spine in these pictures, you can see that there's actual um, uh, changes in the shape of the pelvis um, uh, not the actual shape of the pelvis itself, but the orientation of the pelvis, um, just by looking at the AP X-ray. I think everyone focuses on the, the lateral image, and we can measure all of these things, such as pelvic tilt um, and sacral slope, but you can actually notice these changes on the AP X-ray. And I think the easiest thing to notice is the obturator foramina. And I'm not sure if you guys can see my mouse here, but if you look here, um, what you'll find is this is a pre-correction uh, uh, image, and you can see the shape and size of the obturator foramen. And um, for the orthopedic surgeons, this uh, in patients with a big sagittal plane deformity, the AP pelvis x-ray will look like an outlet view. And as you correct the spinal deformity and you correct the pelvic tilt, and they no longer have to do as much or uh, at all of their compensatory uh, maneuvers, you start to see a change in the shape and the obturator foramen comes back to a more normal view or approximately more of an inlet view. And, uh, and you can see that in this one as well, where the pelvis here looks almost like an outlet view of the pelvis. And here it starts to become more of an inlet view. And so you can see not only the obturator foramen, but also the pelvic brim and inlet itself. If you look at this shape here, compared to this shape here, you can see the changes in, in uh, pelvic alignment that occur with large sagittal plane corrections. And this is uh, shown here in a schematic image. and, and what I labeled uh, as a quote normal pelvis. This is not really normal. This is a pretty, um, uh, this would be a pretty um, uh, anteriorly tilted pelvis. But, but basically it's exaggerated to show what, what essentially happens in a retroverted pelvis. You get, a, uh, you get an increase in pelvic tilt or an increase in spinopelvic tilt as the hip surgeons would say it. And you see a smaller uh, pelvic inlet. You see a larger view of the operator foramen bilaterally. Um, and in a normal pelvis, if you reduce that, that um, uh, increased pelvic tilt, basically what happens is you get an increase in sacral slope, you get an increase in the size of this pelvic inlet, the, and the operator foramen will be smaller. We can also notice the schematic is actually the coverage of the hip joints looks different. So as you can see here, um, the, the hip joint itself becomes more covered anteriorly when you have a quote unquote normal pelvis or you fixed someone's spinal alignment. And, and going back to the, the Charcot spine case, that was the first case presented uh, in the talk, 
Um, you can imagine that as you've dialed in, you know, what may be an appropriate lumbar lordosis for a patient that's in the, that, that stands and walks, as that patient sits, if their spine is fixed in this position, it could theoretically cause a problem in sitting as there's not as much clearance in the front of their hip uh, to achieve the sitting position. This especially becomes relevant either in a patient with, with pre-existing hip pathology or a, a, a full hip replacement. <clears throat> Now, um, the orthopedic surgeons in the room will probably have heard of this paper or remember this from their residency. Um, uh, the hip surgeons uh, have used to view this as gospel, which is basically a paper published by Lewinick back in the 1970s, looking at where you place an acetabular cup for a total hip replacement. And this paper um, basically resulted in something that was defined as the Lewinick safe zone which basically said that you want to put your acetabular component of your total hip replacement at 40 degrees of abduction and 15 degrees of antiversion. Now, and they, and they found that um, if you place the cup inside the safe zone, that there's a very low dislocation rate, and if you place it outside the safe, the safe zone, that there's a high, much higher dislocation rate. The problem with this study was that it was based on a single static supine AP pelvis X-ray and did not really account for the changes in position that occur from sitting, standing, and standing, sitting, as we as we've talked about. And what's been found more recently is that the position of the pelvis is really not static, and, and in fact, the position of the lumbar spine is not static as you change from from sitting to standing. And so there are characteristic changes that occur in a normal spine when you go from standing to sitting. So in a standing position, you normally have this small pelvic tilt you have your normal lumbar lordosis to achieve an upright standing position where your head is over your pelvis. But as you go to the sitting position, what happens is you get a decrease in your lumbar lordosis, you get a decrease in the sacral slope, and an increase in pelvic tilt. And functionally, what this does is you're essentially rolling back your pelvis, and you are increasing the, you are, you are uncovering the front of the acetabulum, or the front of the hip joint, and basically, allowing the femur, or basically the femur does not have to flex as much to achieve a sitting position because you're achieving some of that just by the motion of the pelvis. And so rather than a hip having to flex 90 degrees to achieve sitting, uh, the hip might only have to flex 60 or 70 degrees based on the uh, how much uh, motion there is in the actual spine and pelvis itself. This is shown in schematic form here. Uh, again, you know, with uh, with going from standing to sitting, you get a, a decrease in the sacral slope, you get an increase in pelvic tilt. What that does is changes the position of the acetabulum, and this is a measure called the anti-inclination, this AA measurement. So you get an increase in the anti-inclination of the acetabulum. What that does is allows more clearance for the femur when the femur goes from um, goes into a flex position, and so you basically have less relative femoral flexion to achieve sitting than you otherwise would if you had a very stiff um, and immobile spine. And um, and there are some measurements that, that people have made uh, looking at what the normal spinal pelvic measurements are and what um, uh, and, and how much changes uh, occur. I won't belabor this point, but these are things that you can look up um, in, a, in a normal spine. Now, what people have subsequently found, going back to the Lunick paper, that there really is no safe one, and that cup position alone does not predict the risk of dislocation, and that there are lots of other important factors uh, to, to consider. Uh, and part of this is, is understanding spinal pelvic alignment and spinal pelvic motion, uh, other things that people have discovered that really it's not just the cup position, but really that what's called combined interversion, uh, combination of measurements of the, of the hip, as well as um, uh, the interversion of a femoral component, other things like neuromuscular disease, so that patient with Charcot uh, had that patient had an arthritic hip, um, certainly they have less neuromuscular control of, of, their, of their hip joint and um, would get a higher uh, dislocation risk or anyone with any other neuromuscular disease. Soft tissue deficiency, um, whether the patient had a previous anterior or posterior approach for their, um, for their hip replacement. And then thinking about all these things in the actual functional uh, position of the acetabulum of that patient, and where do they spend their life? Uh, is it a sitting position or standing position? And 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 what have they had? What's going on with their spine that might affect this? There have been several papers now that have shown that spinal stiffness itself is a risk for instability after total hip replacement. This is not just, and this can be a surgically stiff spine, meaning that someone who's had a multi-level spine fusion or even a single-level spine fusion 
or just someone with significant degenerative disease where their spine doesn't move as much as, as a patient with a virgin spine. And um, there are several papers that have shown this, and, and there seems to be a, a dose-dependent effect where as you have more and more levels fused, um, that, that the risk of dislocation goes up, and at the highest in patients who have had previous spinal deformity surgery or a multi-level fusion surgery with the particular pelvic inflammation. And, and this is shown here from one of these studies uh, in, in, um, uh, from, from Buckland and colleagues showing that the dislocation rates uh, go up tremendously um, with patients with long segment fusions versus short segment fusions um, uh, when compared to their, their cohorts that have not had uh, a, a spine fusion at all. <clears throat> if you look, uh, uh, these have actually been measured. And so um, basically what happens again functionally is that you get a, a smaller change in sacral slope and a smaller change in pelvic tilt when you've had a surgically fused spine or a stiff spine in general. And what can happen in the setting of a hip replacement, as stated before, is you have a smaller increase in the anti-inclination of the acetabular component when going from standing to a sitting position. And what this can result in is less clearance for that anterior, um, uh, the anterior part of the femoral neck. And you can actually get impingement of the anterior femoral neck on the anterior rear acetabulum. And this can cause a dislocation as that patient goes from standing to sitting. Um, this has, again, been quantified uh, in patients who have had, uh, who have not had a surgically fused spine versus a fused spine. The zero line is basically no change going from standing to sitting. And so you can see that all of the, uh, the bar graphs there are closer to that zero point in the fused setting versus the unfused setting. Basically, that uh, there, there are smaller changes in the position of the spine and the position of the pelvis uh, when a patient has had a spinal fusion or has a stiff spine. Um, just having sagittal imbalance and having a sagittal plane deformity itself, there risk for instability after a total, a total hip replacement. Uh, there have been papers that have shown that only 59% of patients undergoing total hip replacement have normally aligned spine. And um, I think this has this has been a big change even since, since I went through training, that now any patient who's a high dislocation risk or has already had a dislocation is being considered for revision surgery automatically gets spinal imaging. And, uh, and it's an important part of the workup, both in a sitting position and standing position, to look at the mobility of the spine, to look at the mobility of the pelvis, and to use that to, to plan uh, their, their revision, uh, hip, replace, uh, the revision um, hip replacement approach. Um, when we do our spinal deformity corrections as well, as I alluded to in, my, in my, one of my previous slides, we um, are going to be changing the position of the pelvis, uh, and and and, um, and in addition to that, changing the position of the of the hip replacement. So I think it's very important for us as spine surgeons who um, who are planning long segment corrections or spinal surgery in patients with hip replacements to uh, to counsel them as part of the the preoperative consent process that just having a spinal fusion can theoretically cause a well-functioning total hip replacement to become a poorly functioning total hip replacement. And someone who may not have ever had a dislocation could actually become a dislocator after having a spinal fusion procedure. And this risk goes up with the, uh, bigger with bigger sagittal plane corrections and, and longer segment fusions. But this has become part of my standard preoperative uh, discussion in any patient with a total hip replacement to talk to them that, that there is a chance that I could take their spine or to take that by doing their spinal surgery and fusing their spine, that um, they might be at an increased risk for dislocation just because of the changes in the alignment of their um, uh, of their of the pelvis and the change in mobility of their pelvis and their hip after a spinal fusion surgery. And again, this is just another picture, another paper that's looked at three column osteotomies uh, and how there are measurable changes in the alignment of the hip joint after doing these major uh, uh, realignment procedures. And, and this may have implications for stability of those total hair replacements. So in summary, I think it's really important to have a dialogue with your hip surgeon colleagues and patients that have coexistent hip pathology or, um, uh, or patients that have a spinal deformity and have concurrent hip pathology where you're not sure what to correct first. Um, I don't think that there is a steadfast answer here, whether to do the hip first or the spine first. Um, I think reasonable, reasonable people 
can disagree on that topic still, and there's not a, 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 a an algorithm that you can necessarily follow, but I think it's important to talk to your hip surgeon colleagues to decide what's best for that individual patient. Uh, I think it's important to identify patients with spinal deformity and any patients that are at risk for hip dislocation. Um, they should be getting uh, long segment spine films and potentially also be sitting and standing film, looking at the mobility of the pelvis um, and, uh, and strategies that your hip colleagues can use in patients with spinal stiffness or spinal deformity are to adjust the position of the cup to, um, to adjust for what their position of the spine will be in the standing position, and also consider approaches that might uh, theoretically have a lower dislocation risk, such as an anterior hip replacement approach or an increased constraint of the articulation, uh, such as the dual mobility. Um, uh, but I think that this is something that we're going to learn more about as time goes on. Um, but I think that um, it's a really interesting topic and um, very important for all of us to learn about and to understand as much. Thank you very much. Great stuff, Vinu. Thank you so much. This is uh, insightful. Please accept our virtual applause. Thank you. Now, uh, can you go back to that last slide? So a uh, couple of take-home questions, if I may ask those. So um, the, the simplest thing, first of all, is let's not talk about the long fusion patients, but patients with a short segment fusion need, let's say they have a isthmic spondy or a, a degenerative uh, spondylolisthesis, and they have a pretty bad stenosis, but they have a really ugly hip joint. So that kind of a conundrum of both are bad, and it's a short fusion. Who goes first? Uh, the patient can't bear weight. It's an antalgic uh, uh, gait pattern, but they also have a pretty bad stenosis. It's nothing critical right now, so no motor deficit, no bowel bladder compromised. But in that kind of a hypothetical scenario, it's kind of almost a 50-50 split. In an ideal world, who'd go first? Right. So I, I think this is a, it, it, I think it has to be individualized for the patient. I really make, uh, I guess, use selective nerve blocks and selective injections uh, commonly in these patients. Um, you know, so if a patient, it, sometimes it can be very difficult to tell and if it's buttock pain, is that from their L5 radiculopathy or is that from their, their hip um, uh, hip pathology, and so I'll often send these patients for uh, an inject intra-articular injection of their hip joint to see how much relief that gives them, uh, or a uh, select movement block of their L5 nerve. If someone has a really arthritic hip, I usually will recommend their hip to be done first for the reason that um, when they get their um, when they get their hip fix, often these patients have a really stiff stiff hip, and so they are actually having to utilize the motion in their spine more, and by fixing their hip, they're actually going to have a little bit more motion, and it actually may take stress off of their spine, and they may be able to build their potentially a little longer before you fix it. Um, as opposed to if you fix the spine first, you, our treatments unfortunately are not motion sparing. Um, uh, uh, typically, although you know occasionally lumbar arthroplasties are done, but obviously for an isthmic spondylolisthesis, we're going to be doing a lumbar fusion. That's going to actually place a little bit more demand on your hip joint and uh, and may actually make your hip arthritis more symptomatic. So I'm tempted in those cases to tend to do hip first, but I think it's certainly individualized um, uh, for the patient. You, you uh, vocalized my personal preference as well. Uh, I'm very much uh, preferable to hips first uh, to allow patients to walk. The biggest breakthrough in spine surgery from my end is to mobilize patients early and aggressively. And if you have an antalgic limp, uh, they will suffer in their backs quite miserably. Second question yes. uh, of uh, two more, if I may. Um, the other extreme now, let's talk about an ankylosing spondylitis patients with a badly forward tilted posture. Uh, there's no fracture, there's no uh, pseudoarthrosis anywhere. One of my observations prior to considering a spinal osteotomy, a pretty morbid procedure, is to carefully look at their hips and have been amazed how much happier those angst spawn patients are when their hips are replaced, even if they're not horribly arthritic, but they have kind of painful hyperextension. Uh, is this something that you can explain? Is this something that you've observed? i uh, be curious to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think it's a really interesting question. You know, I was involved in an, uh, an SRS um, uh, uh, discussion about uh, this actually fairly recently when and we had some very, very interesting cases presented by uh, some colleagues from China um, that, that in, in the ACC, some very, very advanced 
uh, presentation of ankylosing spine plantis patients, where they're basically a, a chin on ankles, you know, type of deformity. And I think those can be really challenging to manage and, and really challenging to position. Uh, actually, you know, if you have an ankylosing spine plantis patient with, with a stiff arthritic hip, um, off, you know, you, there's, there's two possibilities. One, can, they can suck an extension, you know, but uh, but also they can suck an flexion. And, and for positioning for spinal osteotomy, it can be very difficult just from a positioning standpoint. Um, in, in the experience that I've had, um, uh, much less than you, I'm sure, um, I also find that when their hips are replaced, they tend to be better and to deal with their spinal um, uh, issues better if their hips are done first, and so that tended to be my preference as well, is to address the hips prior to addressing the spine. Great. Now, thank you for uh, that answer. Final question for me, and then I'll ask Rod uh, to ask you some questions. Uh, as I look at this table for ideal cup position, uh, I, it's been decades since I've done my last hip replacement, but I'm pretty sure that A, if I did a hip replacement I'd be within about a 10 degree uh, error in terms of the precision of my cup placement, despite best efforts. Osteophytes, soft tissues, et cetera. Most orthopedic surgeons don't use 3D image guidance or something like that to try to get an independent verification. It's a gestalt thing. So a 10, 15 degree uh, mistake, it's not even a mistake, imprecision is uh, the better word, is probably almost uh, normal if you really critically looked at cups. So the point is the following. Nowadays, manufacturers have actually far better overhang joints. Uh, they have cups that have a, a better kind of a seam or shelf on the side, or they have the dual mobility cups. So given that there is such a narrow zone of error, if I look at that graph, right, I mean, 10, 15 degrees, that's... Uh, that's right where critical changes uh, in terms of stability would happen for spine patients. So, A, should hip surgeons nowadays uh, use 3D image guidance to try to have more precision, or B, why not just ask them if they have spine problem patients to put in a dual mobility cup or an extra overhang um, a device, or just do a minimally invasive anterior procedure if possible? Right, I, I totally agree. I still remember in my in my residency, one of my uh, one of my mentors uh, when I was on the the hip service uh, used to say, you know, for a left total hip replacement, when you want to aim your uh, inserter towards the autoclave in the corner of the room, and for uh, uh, the other side, you aim towards where the circulating air sits. And that's how you position your cup. And so, obviously, uh, I think that we've come a long way in terms of understanding of uh, implant position. Um, I think that a lot of hip more and more hip surgeons these days are transitioning to uh, anterior approach in, in appropriate patients. I mean, the benefit with an anterior approach, uh, as I'm talking to my hip colleague, is that you can easily obtain thoracity uh, in, in those pictures and so or in those um, approaches without much trouble. And so it becomes much easier to actually dial in your inclination where you want to um, uh, because you can get an x-ray and measure it. I think the other thing that they often do is they will have their x-ray in a standing position and have that posted up in the room. And essentially what they can do with their image is to pants the beam of the thoracity uh, uh, machine so that their AP of their pelvis in surgery matches the AP of the pelvis in a standing position for that patient. And then they can place the cup using that that thoracoscopic image using that AP of the patient that simulates standing position, and that helps at least with the inclination component. Uh, Anteversion is a little bit harder to measure using that technique. There are ways to measure it. Um, I think it's a lot to do. I think you'll see more and more over the next, um, you know, five to ten years. Uh, I think you'll have more and more uh, hip surgeons using some type of navigation uh, as we develop more understanding uh, of, of the ideal implant positions. Uh, and, and I think, you know, a lot of the cases that are hip, uh, undergoing hip replacements obviously never see a spine surgeon or uh, even know that they have spinal degenerative disease uh, pathology. Uh, but I think in any, in any patient that's had spine fusion, it's worth, um, you know, educating your hip colleague uh, if they don't already know this about this and, and they should, uh, you know, reach out to us and, and ask what our thoughts are in terms of, you know, what, how stiff is their spine, you know, do they need to 
potentially change their composition or take into account uh, their spinal stiffness when, when planning their implants or their hip replacement. Great stuff. I'll ask Rod to take us out from here. Okay, here we go. Um, can you go back one slide? Uh, go back to the case that you showed, Vinu. Uh, one more back. Sorry. Yeah, that one there. So, um, you know, what's interesting to me, so I've had patients who, um, who I've had their hips replaced uh, before deformity surgery. I've had also hips replaced after deformity surgery. Um, and as Yen said, I don't know, you know, it's kind of frustrating when you have a patient who has a hip procedure and then they start to dislocate their hip. Uh, in both cases, th it was interesting. The hip surgeon actually said it was because of the spine fusion. Um, and so it, you, they were reluctant to actually revise the hip or do anything. Um, and uh, But when you look at a case like the one you're showing here, um, and, you know, this is like a camp to cormia. Uh, Jens and I were looking at this. And, you know, it's, uh, it's one thing to look at the hips and the pelvis, but if you look at the patients, I think in part of this, I know, you know, like the imaging, it's just a journal, uh, but, you know, this patient is still not aligned even after you can see, you can basically just sign them up. They're going to go up to C2. Um, and so... You know, there's this, and uh, and even if you see, probably, I wish we had the pre-op films even before this surgery, is um, it's so complicated, and these patients have so many different factors. Um, and even, I think, you know, this is a great, I, I think this, for me, uh, as a neurosurgeon, we kind of ignore the hips. But also, I think getting EOS, looking at the knees, looking at the feet, you know, there's so much uh, gait. We have Dr. Dubasse comes every year to Seattle and the Seattle Science Foundation. And he talks about how gait is this complex function, and we're focused on the hips and the, um, and the uh, spine. And his whole thing, and I think actually he's right, is that if you think about it, you know, as um, a complex... Uh, organisms, you know, it's it even goes back to the circuit of Pepez in your brain. And so, you know, he calls this um, his famous uh, uh, lecture on it's the cone of economy, right? And, uh, and I think now, like, you know, when you look at the, the films that we get in EOS, um, I think we're actually missing the larger picture which is, um, I do think there's going to be a role for uh, getting functional MRIs on patients. Because when you have camptocormia, this is a disease that um, is, manifests itself in the anterior horn cells in the, in the spinal cord. Um, so I think this is just, a, this is my perception, but I think we just are looking, it's like, um, our understanding of brain anatomy, you know, we, we have very little information as to the whole um, structure here. And we always say, and Jens actually talks about this, you know, the spine is like an organ. You know, it's very complicated. It's got muscles that innervate it. It's got discs. It houses the, the nervous tissue. Um, it acts as a uh, support for the entire body. So when you fuse it, you know, what is it that you do, do you get? And in fact, some people theorize, uh, for example, even in Parkinson's, you know, this, um, if you fuse the spine, what are you doing? There's some functional uh, data that shows that it has an effect on um, neuronal activity. Uh, so it increases a chance for people to get dementia, Parkinson's, um, because it's a stress on the body and it activates Golgi tendons, which, you know, creates this huge cascade. So I think this was a great talk for me because everything we do, everybody just focuses on what they're doing, but actually it's much more complicated. Um, and uh, I have so many patients now that have these anterior hip displacement or dislocations, and it's very frustrating um, because I do think we're, we're sort of catching a glimpse of,
what actually is really the underlying pathology. Um, and I just wanted your thoughts on uh, VNU. So I have these several patients who orthopedic, the, their hip surgeons are refusing to do anything. What's your advice on patients like that? Uh, getting another opinion <laughs> or having them get another opinion. I mean, I, th I think that, you know, that's, that's all, that, that's, you know, uh, the spine is fused. You can't unfuse the spine, you know, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not, you, you can't, you can't take it apart and give them the motion back that, that you, you know, we've taken away with our surgeries. And so if they've got a, a, dislo a dislocation problem, I think you have to address it as best as you can. And I think there are strategies, um, uh, you know, like we kind of talked about, you know, with either a different approach or, or a different um, uh, amount of constraint in the articulation um, uh, or, or changing the offset of the, of the, uh, the femoral component. All these things can be done to try to make a, an unstable hip stable. And so I think ignoring the problem is not necessarily uh, uh, a, a solution, you know, um, and so, so I, I think that these are, I, I completely agree with everything that you said. It's really hard to, I think the more and more that we learn, the more we, we don't understand about how this stuff all relates to one another. You know, a lot of the images that we get are, are static images. And so we don't, you know, even in an EOS image, which I think is fantastic, it still shows the patient in a, in a single, you know, uh, in a single snapshot in time and doesn't address the changes that can happen, especially in a camp deformia patient where they may be able to maintain an upright posture for a second or so, you know, for or a minute and then as they fatigue and the muscles are, are not functioning and their spinal deformity evolves. And so I think that we really lack a full understanding as of yet as to how these things happen um, over time and, and the, the effect of all these other structures on, on spinal deformity and how our surgeries affect all these other things and not just the, the hips of the adjacent joints, but the brain like you're talking about. Um, so I think these are all really, really interesting things and really difficult problems. Uh, but I would say for your patients, uh, send them to another hip surgeon. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Um, this will wrap up our uh, Wednesday STED talk, and uh, it was great to um, uh, review all this stuff and really appreciate you um, and uh, look forward to working with you more. Excellent. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for watching. Hit the subscribe button for more medical content.